Good morning, good morning. I'm going to read it from the NIV, and I'm also going to read verse 9 through 10, well, 8 through 10 from the KJV. All right, and we're going to start at verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 13. Say amen when you get there. Amen. All right. And it says, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judging. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthian church. I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Don't judge immaturely. Don't, ju don't judge prematurely. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. That, each, that at that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying. Do not go beyond what is written. Yes, can you turn me down just a little bit? Do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of the one who is over us against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you, didn't, if, and if you did receive it, why boast as though you did not? And then verse 8, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. He's speaking to the church. He's speaking about their current status as a church in the Lord. He says, already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. You have, become, you have begun to reign, and that without us. And then Paul says, how I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth. The garbage of the world, right up to this moment. And for those that have the KJV, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off at verse, uh, verse nine, and it says, "For I think God has set forth us the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men." For we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. We are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffered it, being defamed, we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the off scarring, scarring of all things unto this day. I write these things to, to, to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for another day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you for the good news. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. God, we thank you that you did not leave us as orphans, but you sent us the Holy Spirit. So, God, I pray that I shall decrease and you shall increase, Lord, that you will give me the words to speak unto your people during this hour. May your word be proclaimed onto this church and beyond the four walls onto our internet, our audience, Lord, wherever you desire this word to go, may it not return void. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
You may be seated. I think right here, this is this is it right here. I turn it down just a little bit. I think, no, that's not it. This one right here. There we go. All right. How does that sound? Sound a little better? Well, God bless you guys. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I know that was a long passage. Praise God. <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made. Praise and worship was wonderful. Uh, I can't, I'm just so blessed. I'm so thankful to God for ministry, for everything that he has brought us through. And let me tell you, you guys have been kind of describing our journey, and it's been a long journey. The five years of traveling back and forth from Richmond was not an easy journey, not by any stretch of the imagination, but I know we made it look easy at times. Because son, we just get in the car, we just go. It becomes second nature for us to do what we have been doing. But there are times where the struggle is real. Just yesterday, let me describe to you my struggle, our struggle, me and First Lady. And praise the Lord for First Lady because she does a lot. She does a lot behind closed doors. And a lot of times the family has no choice. They, they have no option. Once the Lord called me the pastor, and I did have an option, and I tried, I tried to select the no option, the no box, but the Lord was going to have his way and his will. He says, I'm going to get you one way or the other. Why? Because I ordained you. And I said, well, well, can you not ordain me? <laughs> I ordained you, right? So as soon as he ordained me, he ordained her. Amen. He ordained our family. They had no choice in the matter. I remember when we first started, my, 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 my wife would be like, well, I didn't choose this. I know, sweetie. I know you didn't choose to be a first lady. It just fell upon her. But, the, but, but to whom much is given, much is required. And because the Lord has put much on us, much is going to be required from us. So he requires us to walk in a way that's holy and honorable. He requires us to lead the way because he has appointed us above this ministry here. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, obviously, they, 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 they are the head of this ministry, but he has placed us as under shepherds of this ministry. So a huge task, a huge challenge. Just yesterday, I had to do a, bir a birthday for one of our patients. Uh, hospice, y'all know I do hospice. So, you know, anytime we have a birthday that we can do at the end of life, um, it's important for us to do it because we don't know if they'll have another birthday coming up. When you get on hospice, if we can celebrate your birthday, we're real adamant about doing that. So I turn around and celebrate a birthday on hospice just to go and to officiate a funeral at 10 o'clock, celebrate a birthday in Williamsburg, then turn around at 12 o'clock, officiate a funeral. So I go from celebrating life to celebrating death, and after celebrating death, guess where I go? I go to go see Papa at the hospital in Norfolk Centera. The struggle, the struggle is real. And let me tell y'all, doing funerals is the least thing I enjoy doing. I, it's not, I don't enjoy doing these things. I, I, I can't wait to do a funeral, to officiate funerals, right? And then when I do well in these funerals, people are like, oh, well, you, can you do my funeral? Can you do my funeral? I'm like, well, I don't want to, I don't, don't want to do funerals. That's the, that's the least favorite part of my job is to officiate. But this is the journey. This is the cross. This is the road that God has called me to travel. And I'm reminded of Acts chapter 8, chapter 9. And, and, and I love this because the same thing with Paul. The Lord told Paul, and, well, he told, he told Ananias in verse 15. He says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. But in verse 16, he says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So I thank God that he did not show me in the very beginning how much I had to suffer for his name. Can you imagine when God called me to the ministry back when I was on active duty in the military in 2009, when he said, look, I want you to proclaim my name. I want you to be a preacher. I tried to turn around then. But can you imagine if he says, not only do I want you to be a preacher, but I want you to pastor a church for an extended period of time. Not only that, I'm also gonna call you to be a hospice chaplain. And not only that, I'm going to lead you to do a multitude of funerals. In addition to that, I'm going to postpone your move from Richmond to Chesapeake for at least five years. Can you imagine if he would have told me all of that in the beginning, how much I would have to suffer for his name's sake? Huh, I 
imagine if God would have told you in the beginning everything that you had to go through to find yourself in your situation today. Huh? Many of you, Pastor Pa, elders, especially the ministers that are ordained here, how many of you would have known that in the very beginning of your life that God would call you to be in such a position? That you would have to go through all of these things just to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of us wouldn't have accepted that calling. The Lord didn't tell Paul everything he had to go through in order to pick up his cross and follow Jesus. He just says, he just says, look, I must show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. He didn't say it all in the beginning. He showed him along his journey. And now that I look back and I'm thinking to myself, well, if the Lord would have showed me all of this beforehand, ain't no way I'm following him. Ain't no way of doing all of that. No, sir. Take me now, Lord. <laughs> Take me now, Lord. And let me tell you, what comes with the territory is not only I pastor the church, now I have been involuntarily selected to be the family pastor. <laughs> I, did, I did not choose that. I did not choose. And I have a big family, by the way. Yes, and I don't have all the siblings represented in the house today, but I have a big family. I do. The Tucker family is a very big family, and that's not even including the white family, okay? And so I just, y'all pray for me, because the journey is difficult, not only for me, but for everyone else in here. And we're talking about cross-bearing. We're talking about what it means to bear your cross. It's not an easy journey by any stretch of the imagination. And you know what I'm, what I'm sick of? Who, who, what's that? Who is that? Is that Elder? Oh, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, Elder, one, you see, this is why I like my church, because you, they, he know I'm preaching. Hey, everybody say hi, Elder. Hi, Elder. Hi, Elder. Hi, Elder. Hi, Elder. From the church, we should have brought him up on the monitor. I didn't even, I looked down and... Hey, God bless you, sir. Where you at? You're supposed to be right here. I almost slept. You said... <laughs> <laughs> I almost slept. <laughs> well, praise the Lord, Elder. We all want to say we're praying for you. Yes, Lord. Matter of fact, let us pray. In the name of Jesus, Father God, we thank you so much for another day. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the church that was built on the rock. Lord, you know all of our needs before we even ask of them. And God, you know exactly where Elder Tucker is right now. Lord, we pray for his healing. We pray for a speedy recovery. We pray, Lord, that you will get all the praise, honor, and glory. God, that you will be with the doctors, that you will be with the nurses, that every time somebody comes into his room, they will see the light of your son, Jesus Christ. So, God, we pray for Elder Tucker that you will reunite us back again, Lord, in the very near future, Lord. And whatever it is that he stands in need of, God, I pray that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, say, say peace out, Elder. We're going to let you continue. <laughs> hold on, hold on. As a matter of fact, since we on it, look at this. Look, we were nervous about popping. We were nervous. I mean, he could not breathe. He could not breathe, and he got admitted into an emergency. And we were nervous. My wife, I'm telling you, she struggled emotionally with this, you know? And it was, it was like we didn't know what was going to happen. And he was at OBC. And OBC didn't know what they was doing. And I said, look, we need to get him over to Norfolk Cemetery because that's where he had all his stuff done. And finally, as soon as he got over there, his progress immediately jumped through the roof. Amen. Yeah, they say he's at 95%. Now he's at 95%. Uh, he's breathing. I mean, breathe. yesterday I went to the hospital and we were laughing. I mean, we were laughing so hard. He almost had a breathing episode right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know what we need? We can't laugh about this yeah, no more. Look, look, look. Y'all stop. Hey, hey, hey. hey. We're going to let you go, and Papa. And you know, Papa is reserved. <laughs> He's very reserved, so anytime he laugh, I laugh. Because not too often we can get him to laugh, but when he do laugh, it'd be hilarious. Right. It'd be hilarious. Right, yeah. Well, Papa, we love you. We're going to let you get back so Pastor can preach that word. Tell everybody I miss him. We love you, too. All right, all right, Papa. All right, Papa. God bless you guys. Oh, man, I love it. I love it. So back to the, the message of the hour, cross-bearing. 
what I'm going to do at this time, because, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but this is part three. Here, First Lady, if you can just uh, 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 pass one of those out, and somebody over here, if you can pass one of these out. We're just going to try to conclude this series in regards to what it means to bear your cross. Oh, matter of fact, let me get one of those documents, because I need to, I want to go over uh, the last section of this here. Amen. And so I know, I know some of the saints, they have different learning, uh, what's it called? Learning, uh, learning, uh, what's it? Uh, learning abilities, right. Some are visual, some are auditory, some are hands-on. Uh, so we apologize that we can't give you all the visuals that we would like to give you. Uh, hopefully we can continue to grow and have someone dedicated. And we know we got Sister Stephanie here. Um, there's so much more that we can do, we get it, but this is what happens when you have a volunteer ministry and you ain't really paying nobody the money, right? Hey, this is what it is. So, um, so just to start off, we're doing cross-bearing, and I'm going to go over the essential elements of what it means to cross-bear. Now, this is so important, you guys. This is so important because if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a believer, if you call yourself a disciple and a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, these are some things that you need to pay attention to. Okay? Because not everyone who says Lord is Lord will what? Will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, if you want to be where the Lord is, it's important that you understand what it means to bear your cross. Amen? All right, and so I want you to go to page, go to doo -doo 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 -doo, section three. Section three, the Christian, the Christian's cross, cross bearing. And for those that are online, I will post a link to this article that I found off of Bible Gateway. Bible gateway called cross bearing. So go to section three. This is so important. This is for your, and then you could also read first section, just the background of the Greek term for cross. And then, you know, what Jesus did in part two with him carrying a cross and then what it means to actually bear your cross. And in section three, it says the cross was used also of followers of Jesus, both literally and metaphorically. Because crucifixion was a frequent occurrence and because the spectacle of condemned men carrying their crosses to the place of execution was common. Jesus' words about taking up the cross and following him must first of all have been interpreted literally. Literally in the first century, they understood this to mean literally. Okay? These words must have been understood as a prediction of the same physical means of death for Jesus' followers as for him. Remember, all of the first century apostles, except one, the disciple John, who was exiled to the island of Patmos, were all martyred for the faith. And many who came after them for the next three generations, the next three centuries. It wasn't until Constantine came out with the edit of Milan that halted Christian persecution in the fourth century. So the church operated illegally the first 300 years of its existence. They went against government mandates. They went against the Sanhedrin to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. And many of them met their demise. Many of them were martyred. Many of them were beheaded. Many of them were burned at the stake, crucified upside down. So we enjoy the privilege of coming to church built on the blood of Jesus Christ and built on the sacrifices of the apostles and those who came after him. So this was part of cross bearing. Literally, it came with dying. It came with being martyred. It came with death. And I know we don't like to hear death because we live in a society today where we want to live forever in our mortal bodies. But you can't preach the gospel. You can't speak about the gospel unless we speak about the death of Jesus Christ and those who came after him. Amen? Amen. All right. So look at this. This prediction was soon fulfilled in the early years of the church's history. The tradition about Peter's crucifixion and see also Ignatius, which is an early church father. Google him. Jesus also interpreted metaphorically the cross his followers must bear. It was for him the symbol of their self-sacrifice. 
If any man wills to come after me, he said, let him what? Deny. Yes, <laughs> deny. Deny himself. Perhaps lose sight of himself. As I read last week, also to mean to prove himself false. That's what it means to deny yourself. Matter of fact, I still got the whole description of deny. And I know this is a message that we have been pounding on. Deny to disregard its own interests, to prove false to himself, act entirely unlike himself, to abnegate or to abjure, to refuse something offered, to affirm that has no acquaintance or connection with someone, to forget oneself or to lose sight of oneself, to disown, to abstain, or to deny utterly. My goodness, that's the Greek meaning of denying yourself. I know we won't get too many amens on that. I know, I know, I know. He said, let him deny, perhaps lose sight of himself and take up his cross and continuing, continuing loyalty to Christ along with continuing death to self. So it's a continued following of the Lord Jesus Christ and a continued dying to yourself every day. It goes hand in hand. You cannot follow yourself and follow Jesus Christ. The only way to follow Jesus Christ is to follow him and to deny yourself, to die to yourself, to lose sight of your own interests and be about your father's business and his word. It means we must refuse, abandon, deny self altogether as a ruling or determining or originating element in us. It is no longer the region of our action. We are more to think, what should I like to do, but what should the living one have me do? When we go to our Lord in our prayers, not my will, your will. What is it that you want me to do? Not my own interests, not my own desires, but your desires for my life. That's part of cross-bearing, to deny yourself and to submit wholeheartedly to the Lord Jesus Christ. If in the experience of Jesus, the cross was a, a metonym, I think I said that right, metonym for his mission, <laughs> there is a sense then in which the cross also stands for that mission in life to which the Christian has been called. Okay, so to bear, and I'm on the back page now, the back page, the back page and praise God for the document. You guys can have this. You guys can study it, meditate, and look at all the scripture verses that come attached to it. To bear the cross, therefore, means further that the Christian is called upon to imitate Jesus' commitment to doing that particular task assigned him by God and doing it completely. <laughs> The cross is a symbol, then, of life lived under Christian discipline marked by voluntary obedience to the will of God. My goodness. This is what it means to bear your cross. And you know, it's crazy because you hear this false gospel, this false preaching, this prosperity preaching that we have on YouTube, on the internet, on social media, but you never hear about the real gospel. What it really means to deny yourself, to pick up your cross and to follow Jesus. Okay. How often do we really hear this online? How often do we hear about the essential elements of cross bearing, which I'm getting ready to go into in a few minutes? Look at this. The cross is also a symbol of the shame and humiliation which the Christian must be prepared to endure for the sake of Christ. We talk about the blessings. We talk about the provision. We talk about the good things. We talk about, oh, it's so great to follow Jesus, but how often do we talk about the shame and the humiliation and the betrayal and the crucifixion that's attached to bearing your cross? Huh? When do we hear this on social media? Now, praise God for those churches and those preachers that are invested in preaching the good news, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. But there are a lot of false apostles, a lot of false preachers, a lot of false pastors, unfortunately, not giving you the good news. The gospel, the true gospel. 
Be careful with those. Yes. Paul condemns them. In Galatians chapter 1, you guys already know. In the second paragraph, it says it is a symbol further of the destruction of everything which interposes itself between man and God. Whether it be an institutionalized religion, as in the case of Paul, or material things, as in the case of Ignatius, or whatever else there might be. The cross, too, is a symbol of that mystical union of the Christian with Christ, wherein one's old evil impulses are crucified with Christ, and new desires and powers are released in his life. <coughs> hmm. Did you see that? Wherein one's old evil impulses are crucified with Christ. The last paragraph. The Christian cross is always a voluntary thing. Unlike the convict, he never is compelled to carry it. If any man wills to do so, Jesus said, nor is there ever any hint that the Christian, like Christ, by bearing his cross, acts redemptively or becomes a curse in behalf of others or thereby atones for another sin. Let's, not get, this, let's get this correct, okay? We cannot duplicate what Jesus already did on the cross. We cannot atone for another man's sins. Amen? What else does it say? It says, it says, and we cannot act as one who provides that redemption. Redemption and reconciliation is only through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Anybody else that gives you a gospel that says you must come through me versus Jesus Christ is a false gospel. Amen. If y'all ever hear me say anything similar or anything close to that, I pray that the church, and the church has a good way of correcting me. They do. <laughs> or when they don't understand someone, or they think I, I, I may have said something that wasn't in, in accordance, they'll come to me and praise the Lord. We must be accountable to each other. That's why I love the ministry, the small ministry, because we can be intimate with you guys. We can help keep you guys accountable and keep you guys on a narrow road. Amen. In the confines of a mega church, you can't do that. You can get lost. You can get lost real easy. Be in the background. I ain't got no accountability. Nobody even knows I'm here. But 99% of the churches in America is, guess what? The small church. The other 1% of mega churches. The small church is where it's at. Where you can have access to your pastors, to your ministers, to your elders. So they can help you be accountable for your actions. If you guys ever have a need, need counsel on anything, we are here. Open door policy. We want to make sure that you stay on the narrow road. I, I can't imagine 5,000 people in my congregation. I would be crazy. I did. I, I, I struggled just dealing with 50 of y'all problems. <laughs> I'm thinking, you imagine 5,000? I, 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 need, I need 500 pastors there doing this cross with me, okay? All right, so praise God for the small church. Praise God. And, and any church, praise the Lord. You know, there's not a, a, a comment to anybody else. We can only focus on what we got going on here. Yet there is a sense in which the Christian who bears the cross fills up supplements on his part the things lacking of the afflictions of Christ by continued acts of self-denial on the part of successful individuals through the years in the interest of God and humanity. The work which Christ began continues even to the present. So the work is not finished. It's not over. Not until God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. The mission, the cross of Christ still continues on to this present day. You still have a mission. You still have an assignment. You still have a purpose. There is still a will for your life in Christ. And we must follow that will. And I know we have a lot of things going on in our life. I know many of us want what we want, where we want it, how we want it, especially in America where you enjoy a multitude of liberties. But let me remind you, just because it's permissible don't mean it's beneficial. Just because maybe America grants you this right, free speech, free to protest. What other freedoms do we have? Free to vote? What other freedoms do we have? Freedom of press? You got all these liberties. It's so many. I can't eat. I can't eat. Think. I'm drawing a blank right now. That's how many we got. <laughs> Don't need mine. Don't mean it's biblical. Amen? Amen? We have to follow God's word. God's word is our constitution. That's our mandate. That's our guidance. That's why he preserved it for us so we can have access to it. That's why we need to meditate on it day and night. Amen? Amen. 
So this is a document for you, cross-bearing. Cross-bearing, please keep that. Now the other document you have. I did this on the way traveling from Richmond, praise the Lord. And an hour I drafted this together. God is good. I had nothing as of 6.30 this morning, and this is what I came up by the time I came down here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I was struggling to keep it all on one piece. You see, I started out big. Notice I started out big, but then I was like, I had that idea. I wanted to print it out to the states, and I got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Y'all can't even come for me because I gave y'all sheets. Uh huh. Better than having to write on the six bullets that you have on your bulletin. All right, praise the Lord. The pastor has given you something tangible to leave out of here with. But elements are cross bearing. Number one, number one, deny. We talked about that. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Luke 9, 23, whoever would come after me must deny. That's the first part of cross-bearing. In all three synoptic gospels, it's mentioned, the command to deny yourself before anything else. Second, pick up your cross. Pick up your cross. Now, meaning... As we talked about in the document here before this one, to live a life of self-crucifixion, of self-denial. B, to identify in his sufferings. Praise the Lord. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Praise the Lord. Okay, so to identify in his sufferings. See, 1 Peter 4.12. And I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to give you a lot of word. And you got it written down, so you're going to got to worry about following up or keeping up with the pastor today. You have it all right here. God is so good. All right. 1 Peter 4.12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trials that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now check this out. In verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler however if you suffer as a christian do not be ashamed but praise god that you bear that name now there's another fake gospel out here that now they don't even want to call themselves christians anymore they just want to call themselves followers of jesus or disciples they're trying to avoid the label or the term christian because of the stains that are attached to some of the things that happened throughout church history so we got, and let me ask you this question. What, what tree is there not a bad apple on it? Huh? We can look at everybody's history. We can look at every institution and we can find something wrong with it. Okay? So be careful because the Bible says what? If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Amen? So I want to debunk that real quick. So there's a difference between general suffering and suffering for Christ. There's a difference, by the way. Okay, your refrigerator breakdown, you got a lot of cats running around in your house that you don't want to have. Okay, that's general suffering. That's not suffering for Christ. There's a difference between general suffering. The printer broke down. Look, our, our freezer, our fr fr refrigerator's broke. Both units of our AC unit right now, something's wrong with them. That's general suffering, though. You know, the stuff that breaks down, the stuff in your life, that's general suffering. That ain't... For, for following Jesus Christ, okay? So there's a difference between general suffering and suffering for proclaiming the name that is above all names. Like, for instance, Darius and his wife, they go out and they do evangelism. And when they preach the gospel, guess what? There may be some suffering. Some people may reject that message. Some people may mock them because of what they're doing for the faith, okay? That's suffering for Christ. Look at what the apostles did, what the disciples went through. They suffered for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were martyred because they were preaching that name. And they weren't allowed to. And because of that, they experienced a whole bunch of suffering. So know that there's a difference between general suffering and suffering for Christ. 
Are you generally suffering or are you suffering because you're following after the Lord Jesus Christ and you're picking up your cross and you're doing what God has called you to do? There's a difference between that suffering. Amen? Amen. Okay, just want to carry that. Number three, to carry around in your body the death of Jesus. Now, we don't speak about this when it comes to cross bearing. Look at what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. It says, we always carry around in our body the what? The death. The death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also may be revealed in our body. So what does it mean to carry around the death of Jesus? To identify not only in his death, but to also, look at this, to mimic how the Lord Jesus Christ responded right before he died. How he responded to his accusers. How he responded to Pontius Pilate. How he remained silent when they was accusing him of all kind of false things. To carry around in your body. means to also identify, but also to mimic his response when he was at near death. All right? So to carry around the death of Jesus. And then Deacon Darius was like last week, and I appreciate this, because I didn't get a chance to go through it, but Romans chapter 6. I only read a part of that verse, but look at what it says here. Chapter 6, verse 4. No, verse 3. It says, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into what? Into his death. We don't want to talk about this, but this is part of cross bearing. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So when you get baptized, how many of us have been baptized? How many of us have been baptized? If you haven't been baptized, please get with us after service. We'll make sure we plan a baptism just for you. Praise the Lord. But what, what does baptism mean? It means that when you go into that water, you bury your old self. You die to your old self. And then when you come out, you represent the newness of life, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So all of your old ways, your old patterns, your old desires, when you got baptized, you buried it. That's it. You buried it. Who goes to the funeral and digs up a body? Huh? Who digs up a body? We don't dig up a body. But some of us are living in our bodies that were supposed to be buried during baptism. Uh-oh. 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 Uh oh, Lord, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, huh? Huh? I mean, how many of us are supposed to be burying our old way? But yeah, you know what? No, I don't want to bury that. I want to, I want to keep that going with me. No, no, I don't want to get rid of that. It feels too good. So, so I'll bury this. We select what we bury, huh? When you die, you don't get to choose what you bring into your coffin, huh? Can you imagine that? Hey, Lord, wait. Before I die, hey, first lady, make sure I have my chains. Make sure I have my, my Adidas shoes. Uh, make sure I have those favorite books of mine. Put it all in the casket. No, when you die, that's it. You have no more say so. But yet, we who are alive, who are supposed to be baptized in Christ, want to carry those things that we are supposed to bury, still alive with us today. Huh? Those addictions, those temptations, that sin, your old way of life was supposed to be buried. So if you haven't buried those things, if you haven't buried the flesh, if you haven't buried your own cell, then you need to be rebaptized. Start over again. <laughs> Just saying. Amen. Don't worry. Hey, I've been baptized like three, four times. I had to get it right. And sometimes it's only supposed to happen one time. One time you're supposed to bury it, deny yourself. You see, but they understood during the first century what denying yourself really meant. They knew that they could not carry on in their old ways. They had to let it go completely. They understood. Now, whether they got it right all the time, look, God knows we all fall short of the kingdom of, uh, 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 kingdom of God. We, he knows we fall short of his glory. Praise the Lord. But we got to constantly, continually make efforts to follow after him, to bear our cross. Deny it, bury it, and move forward. Amen? Amen. Don't look back. Don't make excuses for why you're still participating in the things of the world. Bury it for once. I mean, God is giving you the ability. He's giving you your Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit. Deny it. He is able and just. Yes. I know. I know, saints. 
So thank you, Deacon Darius, for making sure that I, 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 I put that out today. We got to bury that. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. go on, bury it. What you waiting on? Bury that sin. Bury that temptation. Bury that desire. Stop making excuses. Okay. Amen. Amen. Why? Because we don't know the time nor the day that the Lord is coming. He comes like a thief in the night. We cannot play around with our faith. We cannot keep postponing things until the next day. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? God calls us to account now. So then this way, when we face him at judgment day, we're already made righteous. Amen? Amen. So you got an opportunity to do it now. Don't wait. Tomorrow not guaranteed. The apostles were exposed to death constantly because of who they represented. Thus, they carried in their body the death of Jesus. Four types of suffering. Mark 11, 34. These are some things that you can anticipate. You won't probably experience all of them, but these are some things associated with bearing your cross. Like what happened with Jesus? They mocked, they spit, they flogged, they killed him, they condemned him, they betrayed him, they humiliated him, they tortured him. These are some things we can expect to receive as we follow Jesus Christ and his will and his assignment for our life. Going back to the verse of the hour in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. It says that we were put on display at the end like those condemned to die. What? And not only that, they were made a spectacle. So sometimes you will be made a spectacle because you may be the only one in your clique that says yes to Jesus. Amen. That says repent. Jackie, post it on Facebook. Repent. I said, whoa. I said, whoa, is that my Jackie? Did she just say repent? And she put it on a story. You see, there's a difference when you put it on your story and you just post a regular post. You see, on your story, everybody get to see it. Because when you pop up, you see all the stories there. Well, she put it on a story. I was impressed. I was impressed. I mean, out of all verses she posted, I mean, for God so loved the world, he gave. No, she said repent. And she put exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Like, don't wait, do it now. <laughs> Praise the Lord, let's give Jackie a round of applause. Yes, yes, we need more of that. We need more of that. Use your social media regardless of lost friends. So if you lose a friend or two, hope, oh, pastor, I can identify with you now. Okay, I lost some friends in this journey. We use it to the advantage of the Lord. Amen. Your friends need to hear the good news. They need to hear a message of repentance. Praise God. Okay, not only this, look at this. It says, we are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. This hour we go hungry and thirsty, we're rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. So look, part of cross-bearing, there will be times when you'll be weak, there will be times when you'll be dishonored, there will be times when you'll be hungry and thirsty, there will be times when you'll look like a rag. <laughs> <laughs> that went over your head, okay? Sometimes you will be brutally treated. Sometimes you may be homeless. You know, they experienced homelessness because they kept following the Lord Jesus Christ. They went from city to city to city to city. Jesus said what? A prophet is not accepted in his own town. Matter of fact, he was born where? Where was Jesus born? Was he born at Marriott? Spring Hill Suite? The Renaissance? Where was he born at? Huh? Huh, little, little, little manger? Huh? Where, where there's animals? Feeding trough, that's where he was born. Hmm? Cross-bearing saints, this is the gospel. This is the gospel. You may lose your friends, you may lose family members, you may be tempted, but even when we are tempted, God doesn't give us more than we can bear, and he provides an escape route around those temptations. Some of us, it feels so good that we don't take the escape route. God gives you an escape route. What's an escape route? Say no. <laughs> it's that easy. Say no and take the escape route. Don't dive into the temptation. That's exactly what Satan wants you to do. Okay, so you're going to be tempted. Times of suffering, you will experience demonic attacks. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of this dark world. There is real evil. There is real hatred that's present in our world today. 
I know you guys see it manifested throughout your news station. There is a real evil. It's against Satan himself. For we are at war with the enemy. All right? Five. Place last. Place last. Look at this. The apostles were placed last. Like at the end of a procession. Okay? So when we say yes to Jesus, we join with Jesus in what? The death march. Oh, my goodness. We join with him in the death march. When you sign up, when you lose your, your sight to yourself and you follow him and his will and his way, sometimes that may require one's own life. You join in the death march. You join in the procession. Look, look what I said here. It was intentional by God that the apostles would be put at the end of the procession as to die in the arena. It was God's will. Not only that Jesus would die by crucifixion, but all the other disciples would be martyred for their faith. Except John. It was God's will. How often do you hear that? Hmm. Hmm. Look what look what look what look what the Lord said in the Gospel of John. I, I I said this to one of my friends. He looked at me as I was crazy. Look in the Gospel of John, the last chapter, in twenty one nineteen, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. That's the gospel. This is the true gospel right here. Cross bearing. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you following? And are you being obedient to it? Last but not least, here go the good news, saints. The good news, all of it's actually good news, by the way, even though we don't look at it as good news. But here go the real good news right here. Turn to your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Here go the real good news. This is amazing. This is amazing. That despite everything that we go through for bearing our cross, despite being put at the end of the procession as one condemned to die in the arena, despite being humiliated, betrayed, persecuted, slandered, talked behind your back, loss of friends and family members, people attacking you, saying all kind of false evil things about you, Despite all of everything that you've been through, here go the good news. Y'all ready for this? Verse 14. But thanks be to God. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Thanks be to God. Who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. So even despite everything that comes attached with bearing your cross, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. We are triumphant. We have the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. We will be first for being last. That's his promise to us who follow completely the Lord Jesus Christ. He will give us a crown. He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. He will bless you the way he desires to bless you for following him. You will be triumphant despite any attack, despite any wrongdoing, any evil set against you. Say yes to Jesus. Amen? Amen. You will be triumphant, saints. Step out on faith. Trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Seek his face always. When you don't know, it's okay. The things that were revealed were meant for us to know. The things not revealed weren't meant for us to know. It's not intended for us to know everything. So even when you don't know, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always devote yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus Christ. Cross bearing. Deny yourself. This is what it means to be a Christian. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the cross of Christ. We thank you for salvation. 
We thank you that you redeemed us. We thank you that you sent apostles and disciples and prophets and pastors and teachers to proclaim the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And the good news is that even though we will go through whatever we go through for following after your son, Jesus Christ, we will be triumphant. We will be victorious. And we thank you, God, for the good news. So, Lord, we pray that you will continue to give us strength, to give us peace, to enable us to pick up our cross, to deny ourselves, and follow you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you, God, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen, Amen. Amen saints. Look at this here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recite one more verse because I'm concluding this, this message here. Luke chapter 13. Can't forget this, and this is on your side here. I, had, I, had, I, left, I ran out of space, so I put it there. I put it there, Luke 13. Let this encourage you today. Let this encourage you today. The narrow door. The gospel of Luke chapter 13, verse 22. And you can start playing music whenever you're ready. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every neighbor, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you. Where you come from? That's how Jesus is going to respond to those who are not in him and not doing the will of the Father in heaven. But he will answer, I don't know you. Where have you come from? Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you, and, and, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves will be thrown out. The warnings are right there in scripture. Pay attention. You will be thrown out. People will come from the east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, those who are last will be first and first will be last. I'm trying to be last so I can be first in God's kingdom. Praise God. You may stand up as we participate in the Lord's Supper.